Hi, everybody, and welcome. Uh, and I'm Mark Hilliard. And I'm a master at the Arcanum. And with me, I have Miss Bobby Daniels, soon to be film photographer extraordinaire. Um, I have Mr. Fred Clark, and he is re engaging medium format. True? You talking to me, Mark? Yeah. I, I said you're you're soon you're engaging in film again. Yes. And uh, I, I've got Mr. James Long, who just purchased a uh, a medium format, a six by nine Fuji GW six ninety series three. So uh, this is this is exciting. We do have uh, other um, people in the cohort who are interested in film. Uh, Susan White being one of them. Um. I don't know. It, as you guys progress with this, um, we might find that we get other people that are interested in, you know, and, and pile onto the, the film dirt pile too. Um, I, I was uh, going through some of my old black and white gear and I found my old densitometer. You want to buy it? <laughs> I think it still works. <laughs> how, how big of a piece of film will it, will it read? I'll go medium format. I used it mostly back then for 35s, but uh, I did some medium format with it. So, yeah, there's there's been a time there's been a time or two I've wished I had a densitometer, um, and I shoot way more medium format than I shoot large format. Yeah, well, I know it might handle that, but I never tried it, so I don't know. Yeah, and I've got. Uh, well, let's see here. Let's let's talk about this. Uh, I've got about 15 35 millimeter film cameras that have all been refurbished and made light tight again and all gotten new sets of clothes put on them. Um, I've got some that are baby blue, some that are neon green. <laughs> Mark, I'm starting to think you're a real gearhead. <laughs> well, I, I, I tend to collect film cameras. But I figure that if I'm going to have them, I should at least be able to shoot them, right? This is true. Okay. In a pitch. <laughs> yep. And and then for medium format, I've got several. Um, this is. Let me untangle this mess. This is the Fuji GA six forty five Zi. Well, you've got the rare black one, is it? The rare, isn't that yeah, rare? I went for the rare black one. <laughs> okay. Um, that comes in its its titanium body, um, whether you get it in black or silver. Um, it is an autofocus. And the autofocus were, is very robust. It works very well. Once in a while, it'll fail. But most of the time, I get nice, sharp, clear uh, images out of this. This is a six by 4.5 medium format. Okay, and because it's, it's, it's tall and narrow, it automatically shoots in the portrait mode. So when I look through this camera, it's as though I'm seeing in my viewfinder, tall and uh, narrow to the sides. Mm -hmm. So if I wanna do a landscape shot, I have to turn the camera. Okay, um, but they all they make an adapter that goes on your tripod mm. you, and you clip this to it and then you, you release a knob on the back of it and the whole camera rotates mm. and because these cameras are so old you can't get an l bracket yeah. all right so that you can do that uh but th they do make a, a wonderful wonderful um bracket to do that now this one is also a zoom lens. <laughs> I was going to say, what's that noise? <laughs> yeah, well, what it does, it goes down to 55, yeah. and then it does 65, and then it does 75, and then it does 90, I think it's just 90, it might be 95 millimeters. Mm, I nearly went for that. Nearly. Oh, this is the cat's meow. I love this camera. All right. Um, I wanted to challenge with the focus and the light meter and stuff. Yeah, and this has got a built-in light meter. Yeah, exactly. 
Um, and it has a, an A mode for aperture priority. Oh, okay. It has a manual mode. Um, it has an automatic mode. And I actually use the automatic mode. I took my kids to the uh, fun warehouse. Uh, over uh, Not my kids, my grandkids. And I took a bunch of black and white and color images with this. And because it has a built-in flash. <laughs> All right. Uh, but I also invested in a an off-camera flash, and it has a hot shoe, and it's semi-automatic, okay? Um, and it, it works very well, too, but I haven't had an opportunity to really use that. Okay, another nice thing about this is it imprints the exposure and lens data on the bottom of the, the, uh, the negatives out of the image zone. Mm -hmm. Um, so what that means is when I use this camera, I don't have to keep a notebook because everything I want to know uh, about the shot um, is physically tagged on the bottom of each image. So for instance, if I want to know what filter I'm using, if it says plus two on the bottom of my film, I know it's a red filter. If it's plus one, it's a yellow filter. Okay. Um, it gives me the the aperture and the shutter speed. It tells me whether or not I use the uh, uh, the flash, um, and it also imprints the date in in uh, day, month, year format on the bottom of every picture. So this really is easy to use. Okay, um, I nearly did, but I. I I wanted to really learn the, learn the kind of basics with a non-helpful camera, and I can just see how much of a challenge that's going to be now. Well, this wasn't my first. This is the last camera I bought. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, uh, well, no, that's not true. Well, no, you've got that other new one, haven't you? I've got that other new one. I've got that new uh, 6 by 12 format. I'll show you that in a little while. All right, so that's... That and did you notice it has this little soul bag hanging down for filters? No, for filters. Wow. I thought it was your rain hat. <laughs> no, no, it's it's got uh, four filters in it. It's got uh, red, yellow, green, and it has a uh, a ten stop ND. <laughs> it's a good camera. I like that little one. Oh, I like it too. Um, and then, do you do any eight by ten, Mark? No, um, I, I I do five by seven and uh, four by five though. Okay. Okay, and then the, this is the Fuji. Uh, this is called the GW six ninety series three. Okay. I um, mean, you notice it has um, a little level on it. It has a hot shoe. This is a um, for changing rolls, different sizes of rolls. Don't mess with this. If you change this mid roll, you've messed the whole roll up. Okay. Um, it has a a winder that's basically two or one and a half to wind. The aperture and shutter speed are hidden under the the lens hood, uh, and you grip it. And I'm changing uh, the shutter speed, okay? And down here is the aperture. Oh, I'm sorry, this is the zoom. Here's, see these things are so hidden. There's the aperture, okay? And then right next to it is another little gripper that you change the shutter speed. And on this one, this will go from time, which is a bulb. Uh, all the way up to 500th of a second, okay? And it will go from three point F3.5 up to F32. And at F32, that's a powerful tool to have in your hands for a film camera, mm -hmm. okay? Um, now, the time mode, this is kind of a, of, a, of a funky thing that a lot of the older cameras did. You put it in time mode. Okay, and you depress the shutter 
and it opens the it it opens the 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 shutter. You start your exposure, and then to turn to close the shutter, you have to turn the, the to a different shutter speed, and it shuts the shutter. A lot of cameras operate this way. Okay, the the Mamaya um, uh, RZ67, the RB67, they all work the same way. Um, only they're even a little bit more funky because you have two actual shutter releases. Yeah. All right, one to cock the shutter, okay? One to open the lens and uh, raise the uh, mirror, and then to turn it off to, to shut it down, you have to reach forward and you have to shift to a different uh, shutter speed. Okay. So that's kind of common, all right? Can um, I ask a question on it? Yes. Someone I was reading somewhere on the forums that if you, you you can change the shutter and aperture together if you hold if you hold the dials together and it will it will move them together to the correct neck settings if that makes sense. Yes, except so if you hold, hold them together and they don't change from you know if you are not messing around but if you if you change them exactly the same thing so if you went to you go from f11 at Fifteenth of a second to f sixteenth to eighth of a second. It's yeah. kind of, it's as auto as it gets, but. <laughs> but but what that is doing is it's just generating the same exposure with a different depth of field. Yeah. Most of the time, you're going to find that you're going to be bracketing it first. Yeah. All right. We'll we'll talk about that in a little while. Um, now, as with all film systems, you need to have also. A remote shutter release mm -hmm. okay because these are all mechanical and they screw into the shutter okay yeah. um and there are releases and then, then there are releases you got these cheap vinyl covered ones which i just absolutely detest why um they don't bend that they if and if you bend them too much um uh, that you have trouble pushing the insert through. Okay. And then <laughs> there's this one. Oh my, oh my. Okay, let me. Okay. Um, this one is amazing. Uh, Freestyle sells these. And what they are is they're, they're covered with woven metal. And you can you can bend these things really tight and they still work. See that? Yeah. They're ultra light. Um, and if if you if you if you find that you have a camera with a bulb mode where you need to hold the shutter down to have it open, mm. they have a little screw at the top right here, and you turn it and it pops up in the air. See that? Now when I depress the shutter, it stays, it will stay locked down, okay? And to release it, you, you push down on this and it will release it. And believe it or not, most of these have the same system. Uh, even this cheaper one has that. Um, if I screw that, that the little neural nut down, see it's just shut. Uh, open and release, right? Yeah. If I release it, if I push down on it, it locks the shutter down. And to release it, you simply push down on it and it will release the shutter. Okay. Okay. So these are very good things to invest in. So um, where was the other one from, did you say? Uh, Freestyle.com. I'll just put it in my browser whilst we're talking so I can look afterwards. Okay, and they're the only ones that I know that sell these little uh, metal clad shutter releases. Now let me open a, a new tab and make sure that I gave it to you right. Freestylephoto.biz. Yep, that's it. <coughs> Freestylephoto.biz. Got it. Okay. Okay, so that is 
another one of the medium formats that I have. And then I showed you earlier, this is the same camera, okay? This is the, the Fuji GW690 Series 2 rather than the Series 3. The only difference that I see between them is this just has an, an applique uh, for the, the rubber, whereas the, the Series 3 is totally rubber covered. All right. Um, on the back, both cameras have a little slot here you tear the end off the end of your fi your film box so i could i could put one in here that says fuji a cross 100 so i know what films in it you should have that on the back of yours as well yeah and you've got different um spool things by the look of it uh yeah that, that's true the other one has little push buttons mm. okay and the opening is slightly different Okay, but other than that, they're pretty much identical. Mm. Now, on medium format cameras, um, there were two types of medium format film. There was 120 and 220. 220 gave you twice the amount of exposures. Okay, and on the back, they have a movable base plate uh, that's spring-loaded. I can, I can move this in and out. It, pro it provides uh, attention against the film, pushing it down against uh, the film rails, okay? And to go to 220 film, you would have to push in on this, take this out and rotate it around to where it said one or 220 up here instead of 120. You won't really be doing that because there aren't a lot of films available in 220 now except for some color films, okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, we're going to come back to this to, to the loading thing on this because that is so ultra important. Um, I've got one more I'm going to show you here. Bobby has seen this one. This is again a Fuji. I like Fujis. Okay. This this is a what's known as the GF six seventy and. And if the GA was for autofocus and the GW was for a real wide, the six by nine, the GF stands for folding. <laughs> okay. And this is a dual format camera. This is six by six and six by seven. Okay. And on this camera, you change between formats inside here. There is a little switch, okay? Yep. And you just, you, you, you turn the switch to whatever format you want. But now you can only do it between rolls, okay? And then again here, you have to change the base plate for 120 versus 220. On this one, it's a simple matter of pushing down on the plate and physically moving it left or right. Okay, this has the best rangefinder of any medium format camera I've ever owned. It's bright, it's clear. Um, it's really a good travel camera. Uh, the shutter speed and aperture are here. Focus. Okay, um, I'm sorry. The the aperture is here on this one. The shutter speed um, is up here on the top. Okay, um, and it is a rangefinder. All of the cameras that I've shown you so far are rangefinders. <laughs> and what this means, um, oh, and it, it also has a little uh, clever little bracket to hold the end of a film case so you know what film's in it, okay? Um, but a rangefinder means what you, what you have to do is you have to look through the viewfinder on the back of the camera, Move the focus back and forth. And inside the camera, there's a little a rectangular window dead center in the viewfinder. Okay. And you look at a vertical subject and you focus, and it's called a split image rangefinder. So if I'm looking at a flagpole like this with my eyes, 
If it's not in focus, when I look at it through the viewfinder, I'm gonna see two flag poles like this. And you focus and you move the flag poles together so that the vertical lines are all lined up. Um, if I'm real close to the flagpole, I'll just see a portion of it, okay? And it, But the same thing is, it's gonna move back and forth like this. This is how these um, cameras focus. On the older cameras, the viewfinders aren't quite as bright, so you have to really study them and look closely, but you, you will be able to make a difference, um, see a difference uh, when you're focusing. On the GW690, that focus patch is a little bit smaller, but it still works very, very well. Do not drop your rangefinder. I'm going to say that again. Do not drop your rangefinder. Um, and the reason is, is the rangefinders are very delicate. They're, 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 they're uh, a couple of mirrors, a couple of springs. And one of the mirrors rotates in there as you focus. Mm. And if you drop it, that whole assembly in there is going to get banged and wanged out of, out of uh, position. And then you're going to have to either learn how to recalibrate the range finder, or you're going to have to send it off and pay somebody to do it. Um, during our last uh, our Canon workshop, I had this camera folded up in the holder of my door, um, but I didn't pay any attention uh, to the shoulder strap. And when I opened the door, the shoulder strap hook on, hooked on something under the seat, pulled loose, pulled it out of the door holder, and dropped to the ground. And that was the end of this camera. It, and it was just soft dirt. Bobby was with us when it happened. Okay. And it, it, it cost me $300 to send it off and have the camera. It's called CLA, cleaned and adjusted and have the range finder uh, calibrated. But this is such a good high quality camera that I could not see, you know, trashing it. Um, the, 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 to find a, a, a GF670 like this, you're going to pay about $2,000. They are in ultra high demand. Um, to go with a GW690, um, anywhere from 250 to 600, depending on the quality and the condition of it. Um, this is the 690 Series 2. I think I paid 350 for this. Uh, how much did you pay for your Series 3, Jane? Uh, 450 or something, I think. Okay. In my, in my Series 3, I found a company that had a warehouse full of them, brand new. Okay? Still sealed in the boxes uh, in Japan. Um, so I bought one, and I paid $1,200 for it. Wow. Okay. Okay? But I got a brand new camera. That other camera I showed you a few minutes ago, the 690 mm -hmm. Series 3, it is brand new. Okay. Um, so then, you know, I've got, I also have a, a new Daya, D A Y I. They come from China. They're from the same company that makes Shin Hao uh, large format cameras, which is a big name in cameras. Um, I paid like $900 for it, and it's a 6 by 12 format, so it does a negative about about that big it's a panoramic um and it uses a large format rain a large format uh four by five lens um and it it focuses by turning a knob on the end of the lens barrel with after so it won't do all the close-ups it's meant as a landscape or a portrait camera mm. Um, but I wanted something bigger than 6x9 format. The 6x12 just seemed perfect. And I have bags full of large format lenses. <coughs> so I got the camera with a 90 millimeter adapter. Now, a 120 roll of film will do six shots in that camera. In the 690, it will do 
Uh, the, uh, that that is a six by nine. I believe it does eight shots. Yeah. On a six by seven, you'll get um, ten shots. And a six by six, uh, I think it's twelve shots out of a single roll of film. Okay. Um, I, I want to jump into a, another problem with medium formats. Since we're, we're all dealing with medium formats, this is a, a 120 spool. Okay. And you'll notice that when you take your film and you load it into camera, on one side you have your feed spool, on the other side you have your take up spool. And after you've taken all your pictures, the film ends up on the take up spool. You take that. And then you take the empty feed spool and you move it over to the take up side and put it and load a new roll of film into it. It is incredibly important. And I, I cannot stress this enough that when you're loading the film, there is a tab that goes into the slots of this. There, there's a slot here. Uh, there's a tab on the end of the film that you put in there and then you start to, to roll it up and it's going to pull the film onto this onto the spool okay and you have to have it straight the film can't be closer to one edge than the other because if you do what's going to happen the film's going to roll up flat up here and down here it's going to hit the edges of the spool and start and not lay flat and then all of a sudden you're going to have the edges of the film hanging out past the end of this this little flange here and when when you take it when you take the film out of the camera, you're going to get light leaks down into the end. And it'll go in about a quarter inch. Now, it won't ruin your pictures totally, but you're going to get dark for about a quarter inch across if you don't get that film flat on the spool. Okay. So pay particular attention <laughs> to these cameras. <laughs> Making me worried what I've done in there. I think it was flat. No, no, yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm halfway uh, through. I have ruined many rolls of film because I was quick and didn't pay attention. So when it comes to loading the camera, be very, very sure that the film touches this, this flat edge and it touches this flat edge. And as you start to roll it on, because there's going to be an arrow over here that eventually comes out uh, in the film that you're going to see, and you have to line the arrow up with, with a mark on the back of the camera for the starting position. You can yeah. you, you can observe the film rolling onto this as you're moving that arrow over, okay? And you got to make sure that it's flat and tight against the roll. That's so very important, okay? Yeah. All right. So questions so far on various types of uh, medium format cameras? Mm. No, I'm all right. I think. Bobby. No, I think I'm all right. Fred? Nothing from me. Okay. <laughs> um, one thing that I neglected to tell you on that Fuji GF670, the fold-up camera, it has a, a really good meter built into it, too. Okay. All right. Um, but for those of you who are shooting without meters, and those of you who aren't used to viewing and seeing the world as black and white, um, can you guys tell me when you look at a scene? Can you can you envision it as black and white? Mm, yeah, in certain situations, I'm getting there. Agreed. Certain situations for me, but usually I see most things as a picture when I'm looking at things as an as an image. Okay, that's what I use right there, Mark. A Ratten filter. This is a Ratten filter. You can buy these at B plus W. Or B and H, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. And this is called a Tiffin B plus W viewing filter. And what it is is just a dark yellow filter. But it's just the whole scene that you're seeing through it to kind of a a dark yellowish brownish thing. So that what you're seeing is monochrome, even though it's even though instead of black and white, it's yellow. Mm. So you can visualize your scene. By looking through this and and for new people doing uh black and white photography this is a large aid this is a big deal and these aren't expensive they're about twenty dollars and a gadget and a gadget i've 
if this is a brand new one and it just i use it for teaching uh, but i have one in in a case although i pretty much don't need them now all right <clears throat> so let's talk about getting the right exposure on on film cameras that don't have a meter um, you can always go by the sunny 16 rule and if you're outdoor that's going to get you in the ballpark um, and if you are using the sunny 16 rule i i suggest you pack it okay until you get to the point that you can look at a scene and say oh that's f11 at, at one one hundredth of a second okay i can't do that okay um i i choose to use a meter um so i'm going to show you a couple types of meters um i i have a cyclonic l308s does this look familiar i've seen one of those before <laughs> okay. i think i have that <laughs> um, and this one is a mid cost this is about i don't know 250 dollars uh, somewhere in that range what did you pay for yours james not that much hundred a hundred pounds used no okay. from the uk all right and this is both an incident and a reflective meter now incident means that it's looking at the sunlight striking the scene and an incident meter has what's this little white dome on it and it has a sensor in here and you slide the little white dome over the sensor and then you go to your scene so bobby if you're going to take a picture of me mm -hmm. okay yeah you're gonna, you're, you're going to walk up to me and you're going to put this meter right in front of my face like this. Mm -hmm. the dome's going to be pointing to the camera. And you're going to say, take a measurement and push a measure button. Mm -hmm. and it's going to come up and say, at ISO 64, um, <laughs> it's going to be 1 60th of a second at F1. Okay. okay, but you can adjust the aperture. There's side buttons here. Um, so I, I I can go down to uh, let's say f8, and now it says the, it's the one second exposure at f8. Mm -hmm. Now, do you guys realize, of course, that any meter, even the meters in your camera, see the world as as midtone gray? Mm -hmm. Five, eighteen percent. Right. right. Mm -hmm. Okay, by sliding this dome over it, holding this in front of my nose, it's going to give you the exposure that you shoot at. Okay, you don't have to uh, add plus or minus because of the zones. This is going to give you that mid-tone gray meter reading. Mm -hmm. You just enter this data into your camera, set it up, and shoot. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the joy okay of an incident meter it's going to give you every meter reading mm -hmm. to set your camera's exposure up as given on the screen okay now this also has a spot meter in it what mm -hmm. we call reflective but it's not really a spot you know in, in terms of a spot meter we think you know one degree spot where i can aim the meter at my head mm -hmm. and Take a meter reading right here or right here. Okay. This has a 35 degree spot meter or something like that. Um, so you have to realize that this is going to give you more of an average incident meter, like using the, um, all of the metering points on your DSLR. All right, and while that can work, it is easily fooled. And to get around that, you can get yourself a gray card. This is 18% gray. One side is matte, the other side is glossy. 
okay? And then what you would do is you would set it for spot metering. And now you're gonna be at the lens of your camera like this. And the sun is coming over my shoulder and striking this card. And you're gonna do a spot meter reading of this card. All right, even with a, a, a 30 or 40 degree meter, if you get it close to the card without putting the card in shade, all right, it's going to give you an 18% gray reading of an 18% gray subject. <clears throat> and that means that you can enter the data directly into the exposure of your camera and take the picture. Now, if you're taking a landscape shot and attempting to do this, this has to be in the same light as your landscape. If you're standing in the shade, this isn't going to work. Okay. Um, and if this is the only meter you have, then you're just going to have to do a shot of the landscape, realizing that it's, uh, it's, it's a very wide circle that this is measuring. It's 30 or 40 degrees. Okay. So it's going to average, and you're, you're, you're going to need to bracket with that. Can I ask a question then? So with the incident meter, if I'm standing in the same light, as a house I'm photographing, say, 50 meters away. If I take a reading of the incident light and it's, a, it, and it's the same flat light as hitting me and that, it'll be okay. It'll be dead on. But when I, if I do a reflect, uh, yeah, reflected reading of the house by pointing it like this at it, what if the numbers are different? Well, you have to remember, if if you're hitting a if if it's if that spot is hitting a dark area, yeah, of the house now you're operating in the zone system. Right, it's going yeah. to it's going to look at that dark area and it's going to tell you how to get a perfect exposure of that as eighteen percent gray. Okay, so that's a zone five, right, Mark? Zone five. Yeah. So if it's too dark, okay. Um, then you're either going to have to adjust your exposure up or down. Now, the easiest way around that is to take a reading of the, of the blue sky or clouds. Mm. Okay? And what it's going to do is it's going to tell you the meter reading to make those clouds 18% gray. So you're going to add two stops to that or three stops, depending on if you want the clouds to have to be bright bright white or if you want them to have a little bit of detail I see. Okay, so zone nine is total white zone a uh, zone eight is a little bit darker with just the tiniest amount okay and that's where you want to do your clouds at so if you're going to take a meter reading up into clouds it's going to place those clouds strictly in zone five and you're going to, to increase the exposure to stops, zone six, zone seven, and zone eight. Okay. okay. Put the clouds in zone eight. And then you're going to take, you're going to bracket that shot. And you're going to do that for the first 40 or 50 rolls of film. You're going to bracket. And you're going to learn how your meter reads. Take notes. Have a notebook, draw a picture of your scene, draw a circle around the area that you're metering and, and write the exposure that the meter tells you and then shift it up or down in the zones to make, all right, to make a, and this, this works with snow. I mean, if you think back, you know, 30 years ago, when you took pictures of snow, the snow always looked gray, icky. That's because the meter wants it to be gray. Okay, so you would have to add two stops to it or mm. three stops, depending on how bright you wanted the snow. The same rule applies to digital. The meters in the digital systems all try and make everything so five, which is that medium gray. Yes. This gray line here. Okay, Bobby, you remember this from school, yes? Yes, yes, I do. Okay. <laughs> and the photography in the photography company I worked for. <laughs> yeah. so this this all comes back. Okay, so 
That's this little meter here, okay, the, the Seconic uh, L308U. I bought that on a whim, I don't know, about a year ago, and I don't really use it, but it doesn't hurt to have meters if you have different bags and you grab a bag with a specific film system that you have a meter in it, okay? But there is a cheaper meter on the market that I really love. It's a Seconic again. Okay, here it is. It's a little tiny thing. Okay, this is called the Twin Mate 208. This costs about $100. Okay, and like its bigger brother, this is for incident. See the white dome? And if I flip it, it's a spot meter. There's, there is a little um lens in here okay and it will do spot meters or incident metering okay so reflected or incident okay uh, it uses a, a a big old watch battery it lasts I, i've had this for years and it never changed the battery and the way this one works if i'm going to do an a, 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 a incident meter i'm going to measure like you were going to take a picture of my face right um, I'm going to put this at my nose and I'm going to point it at the camera and there's a little push button on the side and you set you, you set your shutter speed here or not your shutter speed. You set your um, ISO. Okay. Um, I'm going to set this to 200. There it's set to 200. That's a little ISO window there. Okay. And then I'm going to simply put it up here. And I'm going to take a meter reading facing my camera, but pushing the button. And now you see the red, the red pointer. You rotate the green pointer and put it over the red pointer. And you read your shutter speed and aperture off the chart. Okay, so this says that um, at f4, it's a fifteenth of a second. Uh, at f5.6, it's, it's basically an A, and so on and so forth. And you just read it right off the scale. It's small, it's tiny, and it works. Okay? Um, if I were to flip it to the spot meter by uncovering the little lens inside here, and I'm, I'm, <coughs> I'm going to point this at the wall, and I'm going to take an exposure... And again, you, you move the green over the red arrow and read the, the data off of it. Now, this has a 15 degree spot meter in it, so it's narrower. So with this one, it becomes easier to take pictures of, to do meter readings of a gray card. Okay. It's, it's ultra light. It's ultra small. It comes with its own cute little dongle bag. So we put it in there. It shuts itself off after a few minutes. It's cute. Come on. <laughs> Bobby, say cute. Mark, that's so cute. Mark, that is so cute. <laughs> Just delightful. Just delightful. Okay. Now, for you really strange people, I have an even smaller meter. No, that's just going to get lost. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and this one is incident only. <laughs> what? It's it's like, fun, right? looks like something you plug into your chat on your cell phone. <laughs> you know, plug it into your cell phone. Really? Yes. So why couldn't you just use the like one of the photo pills apps or something instead of plugging that thing in? Because those are dependent upon the uh, the camera of okay. your cell phone, and those cameras are not calibrated. Gotcha. This is there's a little computer chip inside. <laughs> That's just waiting for me to lose it. Well, I've had it for years, and I've not lost it. Of course, I don't use it. There you go. <laughs> um, I don't like the. I'm, idea. I'm with you, Bobby. <laughs> I don't like the idea of using my telephone 
as a meter. Mm -hmm. But you can. And, and if you want to, they have, they have these, these cute <coughs> that are indeed calibrated. This is from a company called I can't even read it. Isn't that terrible? That's why you don't use it. L L <laughs> Luminar or something like that. I'll have to look it up. Okay. Um, and these things aren't cheap. Okay. So if you're going to go with this, which is only incident, and spend $200, which is what I think I paid for that, you're way better. Yeah, this uh, B and H has one for two sixty nine right now. Yeah, this cute little uh, L two hundred eight. Mm -hmm. I have one. On my, I have one here. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> there yep. you go. But the problem again with that is, is it's using a camera system that's just not calibrated. But no. the software well, has a cross. You can get you can get different version, and then mm -hmm. you crosshair so you can it'll do a spot meeting right into that that crosshair too i did a little test between the dslr that app and and this and for an emergency i'd say that was they were pretty close they were i mean within a third of a stop and all and all the three things i tested but it was very standard condition so i can imagine if you were out or something it would probably where it could cause a problem it could be harder to measure probably yeah well there's trade-offs to everything i mean we know that i mean you you go with the small smaller meter 15 degree spot 30 or 40 degree spot do you remember what it is no i can't remember 30 seems sounds familiar i think okay um or my baby are you ready to see my baby? Here it comes. Here it comes. I've looked at this, I'm pretty sure. This is the baby. This is a Seconic um, L758DR. That's what I've got. Oh, man. This is the cat's meow. <laughs> you know, if this, were, if this were human, I'd marry her. <laughs> It does everything right. Okay. And notice that we have a young version. And then we have the mature version. Okay. This is the, the this is the, the globe uh, for doing uh, incident meter readings. Okay. Um, and it works just the same as the other two meters. And the other two meters are no more or less accurate than this. Okay. So if I turn if I turn this to incident meter reading, and there is a, a little switch here. Here, click. I turn it on. And I point it at me. And I push the measure button. Uh, I'm going to point it at the camera, right? It comes up and says eight seconds at F38. Okay. And then I can adjust that by turning this dial and changing my aperture. Um, I'm going to go down to, oh, let's go down to F4 or 2.8. Now it's one fifteen hundredth of a second. Okay. Um, so it works. It works exceptionally well. But it does the same job as the other two less expensive meters, exactly the same. And all three meters are calibrated. Okay? And there are times that I will use this, you know, if I'm in nice, even lighting and I'm in the same light as, as my subjects in, you know, like I'm taking a picture of a mountain. I will, I will go out there, all right, and I will point it at, at me like this is my subject. It's going to measure the light coming over my shoulder and the same light that's striking the mountain, and then you can do it. All right. Uh -huh. um, I don't use um, the sphere uh, that much, but once in a while it comes in handy. It's nice to have a meter that does it. So I'm going to flip this to spot meter now. 
Okay. And now I have to take the lens cap off because it's got lenses in this thing. And I will look at a subject and it, it, there's a circle in there and, it, and it's a one degree circle. Okay. So I can take a measurement. Okay. It, it reads the, re the measurement right in my viewfinder. This says F2.8 at one five hundredth of a second. And what I'm doing, um, I am uh, looking at a window with some light coming through it. Okay. Um, and again, I can adjust it up and down. Okay. Um, I can change my base ISO by pushing ISO 1. Uh, this is set at, at ISO 100. Push in holding the button, and then I'll move my ISO. Okay. I'm down to 12. I'm going to put it up. Oh, let's go up to 400. All the while, it retains that meter reading, and it changes. Okay, now it's uh, it's at 2.8 at 1 2,000th of a second. Okay, so, and it has different modes in it. Like if I if I know I'm going to shoot with a yellow filter, I can tell it that I'm shooting with a yellow filter. Uh, I have it set up so you can have two ISOs. If I push the ISO two button and rotate the dial, I can change um, exposure compensation. So let me let me go and move that down to one. So I'm taking one stop away. Okay. And now if I push and hold the button, it changes it from uh, a two thousandth uh, to four, th four thousandths of a second. Okay. It just, it just works. It's, it's a really, really, really nice camera, uh, meter. Sorry about that. So having a spot meter is the power of God in your hands. Okay. <laughs> Because now I can point the stuff that I can point that meter at the clouds in the sky that has some detail in them, you know, so, some gray, some some splotchiness, and I can take a spot meter and it's going to say to make that eighteen percent gray, dial this into your camera, and I know that I want it to be white, but I want a little bit of detail. So knowing the zone system, I, I'm going to move it from zone five to six to seven. So I'm going to add two more stops of exposure, which means I will slow the shutter speed down from one two thousandth of a second to one one thousandth to one five hundredth, okay? And I have changed, I have adapted for my zones. Likewise, I could take it, for instance, I'm doing a landscape and it's got trees in it. And there are some tree trunks in front of me that are not quite black, but I can see detail in them. I'll do a spot meter of that. And it's going to lighten it up. Why? Because it's almost black, but the meter is going to make it zone five, which is middle gray, right? Mm -hmm. So I want to move that down from zone five to zone three. So I'm going to take away two stops of exposure. And I'm going to move that, that, that tree that the, the, the meter is going to brighten up to zone five, back down to zone three, and the rest of the picture is going to come into, into metering range. You don't have to choose something middle gray. Mm -hmm. Choose yes. a dark area that you want detail in. You, you say to yourself, I don't want that to be black. Mm -hmm. Okay? Take your spot meter on it. If you, if you enter the exposure data into your camera, that the area that's almost black is going to be middle gray now. So you're going to take five, four, three, and it's going to get a perfect exposure in the tree, and everything else in the picture is going to come into play. Once you do that, the rest of the zones just fall into place automatically, don't they? True, unless it's way out of the dynamic range. Yeah. So what do we do about that? Well, can I just ask on the dynamic range here? Is it true with film? It's about five stops maximum. 
uh, it depends on what you're shooting. Uh, slide film, Velvia, I was about five stops. Um, yeah. uh, color slide or color um, uh, print film is about seven to, to nine, depending on the film. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, I'm always thinking nine inch uh, because I, I I just I have a lot of slide film. I I, uh, I just haven't bought the slide chemistry. And I, while I love the look of, of slides, I would rather have the wider dynamic range of if I'm going to shoot color. Mm. I'd rather have the wider dynamic range of the uh, print film. Yeah, I ha I've, I've got some film for the next week. I've got Ecta. Uh, a couple of portraits, and I do have a uh, Velvia and uh, oh no, I just have the Velvia at the moment, it's a Provia coming as well. But I'm probably going to practice on the things like the Ektar, which I think is probably the most forgiving of all of those. Yeah, Ektar and and uh, uh, Portra. Um, hmm. the thing about Ektar, Ektar is going to increase color saturation, which are going to make fabulous shots. Hmm. If you want to shoot people, you should shoot with Portra. Portra yeah. is designed more for skin tones. Yeah. Okay. And Portra, you can get at 160 ISO and 400 and 800. Yeah. So I keep 400 in my bag. I've got 400 and 160. That's all I could get here, actually. But for landscapes, I'd be using the Ektar 100. Yeah. I was yeah. I saw somebody had done some landscape, but it was more pastel sunset type colors and stuff with the portrait, and it looked really good in that. But it's quite quite a specific thing, and if you can't change your film mid film, you're stuck with like, <laughs> portrait for everything. And so I think yeah. it's going to be Ektar for the week. Yeah. Uh, and the thing about portrait and Ektar, um, and any any print portrait <laughs> film, that is a C forty one process. Yeah, it's easier to, to develop C41 in your kitchen than it is to do black and white film. Mm. Less chemicals. Uh, it's quicker because the the the, uh, the bath times are quicker. And they make two kits. They, they make something called a C41 kit and a CS41. Mm. Um, I suggest the CS kit because it's 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 solution based meaning that the chemistry already comes mixed yeah if you buy the C41 you have the extra step that you have to to mix the base chemicals okay all right and and then put them you know they send powders instead of liquids okay but both do the same exact job and it doesn't matter what film what speed you shoot it at Okay, if you buy uh, Portra 160, Portra 400, Portra 800, Ektar 100, any of the other color print films, it doesn't matter a dang. The development time is still identical. It's, it's 3.5 minutes. Oh, okay. The trick with color development, whether it's slide, which is E6, or print film, which is uh, uh, C41, the chemistry has to be at a specific temperature. And it's pretty hot. It's not boiling, but it's hot. Mm. And you have to you have to keep the, the film, the film tank, and the chemistry at that temperature constantly. Otherwise, you're gonna get color shifts. Mm. But that's so very easy to do. Yeah, we've got one of those heaters, the circulators. Yeah, um, I'm going to share my screen, okay? Mark, do you send your E6 film out for processing? No, sir, I do everything. It's so easy to process your films. You got my screen? Yeah. Okay, um, I'm going to go to Amazon. All right, and I'm going to, to go with a... Circulating um, Dang it. I'm forgetting. Let's see here. Oh, there it is. 
Okay, here we go. See these? You can buy these things between fifty and sixty dollars and one hundred and fifty dollars. So let's 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 go look at this one. Okay, you simply buy this thing, and yeah, yeah, plug it in, and you 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 put it over a big Tupperware uh, container, and it has a clamp here. See the clamp? Yeah. It clamps to the side. You go up here into the control panel. You enter the temperature it wants to be in Fahrenheit or Celsius. Set it. And then it's got a motor down here and a fan. It mm -hmm. sucks water in out of the top. It blows it out the bottom. And it circulates the water and it heats everything to uh, temperature. And it keeps it within a half a degree. Yeah, this, we go. Is, this is what I use for my chemistry for color uh developing it works great okay and you like said amazon okay uh even cooking stores sell these things uh, this is for slow cooking of meats and stuff i mean people will cook um steak in these things to so put the steak in a plastic bag put it in a bowl to put this in there and turn it on and walk away for 24 hours when they come back on a perfect rare steak it's, that's moist and ready to go okay uh, this is that freestyle website you can buy film and stuff here mm -hmm. okay um so let me get out of here again i want to come back to you guys the only issue i have with the self-developing is Firstly, it's like we're, we're not on our own place yet, so it's going to be harder to do. But also getting the chemicals and stuff here in Iceland is, I've looked at it, is just a real hassle. And talk to the camera local camera shop here. <coughs> they will send it off to a couple of companies in the U.S. So I think to start with, it's going to have to be the way it works. Yeah, that's, that. that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, it, it really, really is. Um, but I, I, I got off on a tangent. I want to go back to the meters. I want to talk okay. about we lost Bobby. Yeah, she just sent a message to say she had to go pick Jimmy up. Oh, okay. Um, this also does what's known as averaging metering. Hmm. You put it in the spot mode. Okay, you push the memory button, the memory clear button a couple of times. And then you take you take meter readings of the dark, the light, mid-tones. So if I, I'll just do, I'll take one of the wall. I'll, there's a button on the side of here that says memory save. I'll, I'll save it. Then I'll go up here. I'll go to the the light. I'll save that. Um, I'll go to the the dark table. I'll save that. Uh, let me go further into the kitchen. I'll take another shot of of something green that's really in the, the in the zone uh, five area. I'll save that. And now, if you look, let me see if I can get it where there's no reflection. See those those dot 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 yeah those, those are the meter readings i took okay so if i i look between the top one and the bottom one this says uh let's see here one two three four five six seven eight stops of difference so i to get a picture of this entire range I'm looking at an image that has eight stops of contrast. And there's a button here. It says average. Okay, I push that button and it gives me my zone five meter reading. So now it says set your camera to 1 80th of a second at f2.8. Well, if I don't have a 2.8 lens, uh, let's, set, let's set that to, to f8. Okay, so. F8 at 1 20th of a second. Okay. And it still shows down here, but now it, it's telling you to set your set your exposure according to the flashing one. That's your zone five meter reading. Okay. This is available on the Seconic uh, 758, the 508. And the new six, there's a new 608 or 658 or something like that. A brand new one. In fact, you can't even get them yet. It's so new. Okay. 
but all three of those meters offer this averaging mode. So with the averaging mode, it gives me the dynamic range, it gives me my zone five point and the meter reading for, for zone five, and I just enter that into my uh, camera and shoot, and I'm guaranteed a perfect exposure, unless of course it's backlit. Uh, okay. But if I if I want to take into account the backlighting, then I'll take a, a meter reading of the, that backlight, that backlit area as well. But then it's going to wild see my dynamic range. Okay. Because that's like adding direct sun into it. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> These are the most powerful and most reliable and the most accurate meters on the market today. And it doesn't matter to me if you get the 508, the the the, um, the 758, or or the, the new new one. Um, although the new new one has a color touch screen on it, so instead of dials, you have to move your fingers across the screen, and I don't really like that. Now that would be a pain in the cold, and you know here where you got gloves on and stuff. That yeah. wouldn't work. Um, another nice thing about this is. It, it has custom functions, custom setups, and it, they give you stickers you're supposed to put on the back. So you can, you can change functionality of different uh, buttons and the way the meter reads and sees, okay, uh, by going into the custom functions. And if we take the, this is the battery cover, if we take that off and turn it over, there's more custom functions there, okay? Uh, the battery is a one, two, three, and these usually last for years. All right. And this one has a radio transmitter in it. Hmm. So if you do portraits and, and you want to control your flashes, this, this can talk to your flashes and set them off. Yes. Um, but it also gives you um, a PC connection to connect your flashes to if you like. So you can you can wire this in. And then when you set it to the flash mode, if you press the meter read button here, it'll fire the flashes. All right. And of course, you're going to be using the dome. You're going to be there here, and I'll push this button, and it'll fire the flashes and take the meter reading. Okay. Um, so it's, it's an exceptionally, exceptionally powerful meter. And you notice that I have my gray card attached to the the lanyard yeah because every once in a while i'll get in the mode where i i want to do a a gray card and since i'm looking through this and i i, I wonder what we can see. can you see Maybe it you can just see this you can see the circle and the gr is green okay. green lighting but i can't see what it says all right oh yeah i can 20th okay but but when I put the gray card in front of it, I know that I'm I'm doing a meter reading off the gray card because all I see in the in the display inside here is gray. Yeah. Where if you're dealing with a, a, a 40 degree spot on the other meter, you don't know if you're seeing around the edges of the gray card. So can I just ask then, so if I was to take a reading now, say, with the inc like this, with the incident light on here, just say I want to take a picture of my keyboard <coughs> in front of it, I take a reading, it says half a second F5.6. Now, if I was to go for a grey card reading, I have this handy cloth here, which happens to be grey, apparently. If I was to take, how would I get the same result of this? If I take a reading of that? Well, you're not going to get the same result because the, even though it's kind of gray in color, uh, it it it's a lot it's a lot lighter than the gray card, and light's going to go through the cloth. Yeah, well, to be well, to be fair, it's quite the same number, I think, but that's a lot, that's fluke because it's flat light in here. But yeah, no, yeah, I'm waiting for a gray card to arrive, but I'll just have to practice next week, I think, with. Um, but yeah, no, it should give the same reading as this as versus a spot meter where you're shooting a spot on the gray card. 
Okay. But you got to make the, sure that the gray card is flat looking at the camera, not at an angle. Yeah. And see how it gets lighter depend, and darker depending on the light striking the gray card? Yeah. And flat into the lens of the meter, which is going to be flat against the lens of the, of the camera. Understand. If you have the spot meter, I mean a true spot meter, then you don't need to do this. You can do a spot of that that dark area uh, in your scene that has some uh, structure to it. All right, and then subtract two two, two stops of, of exposure. Um, on the, when you do spot metering on a DSLR, do you know what sort of angle the spot metering is on? They're, that? they're all between three and four. Okay, so you could use you can double check with a DSLR if you. I mean, it's adding a lot to a workflow. I mean, right now, the other day I took photos. I did one with this, yeah. I did one with this, and I actually used the app as well as a third one just to make sure I understood how the light was working. So I won't always do that, but you can use the DSLR if you have it so as a spot meter. Yeah, set your ISO to the same. Yeah. Um, and remember that the lens that you're shooting through affects it too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, all I could do was set it to roughly the same field of view to, to kind of get it, but yeah, okay. All right, cool. um, but that little meter you've got, that's going to that's gonna get you going. That's going to start things for you, which is fine. All right. Um, but this is just a basic intro anyways. Yeah. Um, if you go let's see somewhere, let me go look. I have a zone tutorial. I've got four shots left on this roll of black and white because it was the only film I could get here the other day. So you've got limited film options, but um, I've got four shots left to take. So that will, I have to finish off this first before I change the color of the week. Um, somewhere I've got a uh, Skittles. No, I've got a tutorial on uh, introduction to the zone system. Yeah, it's it's in the cohort Google Plus page. Okay. It, and it's 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 in uh, uh, the section called Mark's tutorial videos. Okay. And there's an introduction to the zone system there. It's at the very bottom. But I also have another video somewhere. And I think I made it private. And it's on it's on my YouTube channel. Uh, but if it's, I'd have to send you the link. I'll, I'll have to find it and send you the link. That's a more in depth dive into the zone system. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um. So. I'm sending out that link. I'd like to take a look at that site. Uh, of the uh, of the uh, the more in depth one. Yes. Yeah. I, I will. I'll, I'll, I will post it. Uh, in the in the chat room, uh, it's been posted there before, um, but I just have to I, I have to go and find it. Okay. Um, it's on my YouTube channel, but I, I have it marked as private, so unless you have the link, you can't see it. Okay. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry I took time away from you. <laughs> the, the, and as always, the dog is more important than everybody else. They always remind you of that, don't they? Yes. Yeah. All she wants to do is just to, to lay around and snuggle with me now because she's gotten she's thirteen years old now. Oh. Okay. Uh, I went to nine yesterday. She had a hard year this year. She's traveled from Hong Kong to Iceland. One of us. She's had bloat as well. That illness had a big operation when she arrived here because she. Got that illness where the stomach flips as well because of all the stress and everything. So she's had a hard old year, Alma. She's a bit older than she probably is now. How long did she have to wait in, in cages for disease prevention? Quarantine here was four weeks. Oh, that's a long time. It was. It was a. That was a tough move for them. Thirteen hour flight, day in a day in the UK, three hour flight, quarantine four weeks, and then. A month or two later, she ended up having to have a huge operation with this flip. So, yeah, it's aged her. 
brought, but we have to, we can't leave him in Hong Kong. You have to bring him. <laughs> I know. I agree. I agree. Yeah, we had to put ours down a while back. That was a tough thing to do. <laughs> oh, it is. This is my ninth dachshund. Uh, for my entire life, I've had nine of these. Wow. Um, yeah. So, are, do you guys have any questions? No, I, th I think for me, I just need to go and I need to just go and practice next week. I'm, I'm going to be taking both cameras, so I'm going to make sure I have like digital work as well because I'm going to um, a place I've not been before either. So it's not like I know the locations very well either. So. I'm just going to practice with film, finish off this black and white, and throw a couple of color ones through, and then see what the results are like when I get when I get scans back in a few weeks. I guess. Um, let's talk about one more thing real quick. Let's talk about different films, okay? Um, I have favorite films. I have films that I like, films that I don't like. Uh, so that's all I can really speak to. Um, but for black and whites, th there are four basic films that I like. Um, I like Kodak T-Max. I like the ISO 100 version, which has been missing for a year and a half because they had problems in its manufacture. Um, but they've just fixed that, and it's now back on the market again. And I like T-Max 400. That's what I've got in here right now. Okay. Um, both of those shoot exceptionally well. Uh, processing is really easy. Um, the chemistry is easy. Uh, it's it's just very very simple and easy for them to work with. Uh, the emulsion base is is very thick, um, so it's it's easy to handle when you're processing it. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, then I like Kodak or um, Fuji A Cross 100, A C R O S 100. Um, I like shooting it because it doesn't have any reciprocity failure until you hit 120 seconds in exposure. Wow. And then for anything over 120 seconds, you just add one stop. Okay. All right. You know what reciprocity is? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I do. Yeah. All right. So I like using it for long exposures. Yeah. Okay. All right, and I've been stocking up on it because there's rumors that Fuji is going to discontinue it. We can get that here. I saw that yesterday when I picked up some film, so I can see that here. Yeah, I, I would I would buy that and, and put it in your refrigerator or your freezer. Okay. Okay, even if you put it in your refrigerator, it'll last you 10 years. Okay. Uh, if you put it in a freezer, it'll last indefinitely. Okay. Um. But yeah, there are rumors that they're they're going to stop manufacturing of that, um, and I've probably got thirty boxes of four by five film in that, uh, right. and probably a hundred boxes uh, of five rolls each of the uh, one hundred and twenty format. Okay, uh, that's the film that I would stock up on is the Acroft yeah. one hundred. Okay. Yep. Um, then I also like another film called from Rolly R O L L E I. Okay. It's called um, I R four hundred. Um, it shoots basically the same as Tri-X, normal black and white film at four hundred ISO. But if you put a seven hundred twenty nanometer filter on the end of your lens, set the ISO down to twelve. Taking infrared photographs. Okay. All right. So I, I do keep some of that in stock, and that's available in every format. They're just they're going like crazy making that film. Um, all of those films can be processed with the chemistry that I like. Yeah. Um, all of them can be processed with Codex Xtol X T O L which is very inexpensive and it's based on citric acid. So it's, it's safer. So you can do it in your kitchen and put it down the, uh, the drain. Okay. Okay. Um, 
They can also be processed with um, Ilford Perceptol, P-E-R-C-E-P-T-O-L, hmm. um, which is a, a, another, it, the, the Axtol and the Perceptol are very low cost. Uh, for $9, you can get a, a bag of, of uh, powder for Axtol, and it'll make five liters. Okay. Um, and then five liters you mix with water, I mix it at a one-to-one -one ratio and use it as what's known as a one-shot. You develop one tank of film with it and then throw it away. Okay. So five liters becomes 10 liters, which means it'll do 10 tanks of film. Uh -huh. Each tank of film of 120 is two rolls. Okay. Okay, so it'll do 20 rolls of film for $9. That's going to have to be the future of what I do, I think, with development and developing here, but it's just not cost effective to do it. You certainly can't import the chemicals from overseas, so I can't buy these kits at the moment. I know. But I won't let them. I figured we'd cover this anyways. But yeah, no, it's good. It's because the shop that I went to, the camera store, does have development stuff in there, but the prices are huge. It's not, it's no cheap. He said it's no cheaper to develop yourself or send it to the. US or Canada to get developed anyway right now with how much they charge. So it's unless you really want to do it. Okay. The other developer I like is the Perceptol from Ilford. Mm. Um, it's seven dollars a bag. And it, one bag will make one liter. Okay. Um, one liter gets mixed one to one with water. So you have two liters, which means uh, that you can do two tanks of film. Okay. Okay. Uh, another develop, developer likes uh, Rodinol. Now, the thing about Rodinol, um, you, can, you can mix it all sorts of crazy ways. It comes as a liquid that has a shelf life of about 100 years. Okay? And you use a syringe. And if I'm going to do... Uh, Rodinol has something you can do called stand processing, um, where you take one part of rodinol and a hundred parts of water mix it a hundred to one you put your film in a tank you pour the rodinol in the tank um you invert it and agitate it slowly for 30 seconds then you tap it on a table to dislodge air bubbles and you put it down and you walk away for an hour you walk back and it's done okay but one one liter bottle of Rodinol, a one bottle might last a lifetime. Right. Okay. Um, and the Rodinol I like is called RO9 from ADOX. RO9. Okay. Um, and it's just got such a crazy long shelf life, and you need so little of it. Okay. And those are the those are the four developers I use for black, or the three developers I use for black and white film. Okay. You can also make a developer out of coffee. <laughs> um, it's called Caffeinol. And there's a Caffeinol group. It's called Caffeinol Group on Facebook. Where you can learn that, what to mix. It uses, ca it uses cheap, cheap instant coffee. Um, <laughs> it uses a little bit of citric acid and it uses a little bit of borax cleaner. Nice. It's a cleaner it's a cleaning powder made of borax yeah you mix it together and you throw it in there and you do stand processing it's it's one shot again but it's coffee based and an orange citric acid <laughs> okay so <laughs> it, and there's a users group on it. it's called caffeinol group on facebook where you can learn about it and you can buy it pre-made there's a company called Film Photography um, Broadcast in Ohio that sells caffeinol pre-made. But you can you can do it yourself. All you need is some borax and you need some citric acid and you need cheap, the cheapest instant coffee you can find. <laughs> that's, that's interesting. Okay. Yeah. And then you're going to need... The only other chemical that you have to have in developing film is a fixer. Everything else you can do with water. You don't have to buy stop bath. Mm. You don't have to buy a, a fix removal or a cleaner. Okay. 
um, it without the other chemicals, it just uh, you're going to do a water bath, you know, a, a rinse with water between steps. Okay. <laughs> and then a longer wash. You, you open up the tank, put it under the spigot, and let the the uh, water flow in and out of the tank, and constantly rinsing it for, you know, if you don't use any other chemistry besides a developer and a fix, then you're going to rinse it for a half hour. Okay. All right. Um, there are companies that make uh, eco-based chemistry too, uh, because you have to have a fixer. You just have to have that. That removes the unused silver. Okay. All right. So all you really need is a developer and a fixer, and you can do it with coffee too. Okay. There's all kinds of crazy, fun, experimental stuff out there. But the capital next on the list for this year and later this year, I think. The capital is not experimental. People have been doing that for years and years and years. Okay. Okay. Uh, but it's great fun. Yeah. Uh, the color print and color slide film, E6 kit or a um, uh, C41 kit. Each kit will do about 20 rolls. Yeah. Each kit costs about 20 to 24 dollars. So you know, dollar to a, a dollar uh, ten a roll. That's that's cheap to develop it. I don't know what you think you're going to pay to send it out. It's going to be enough. But I don't know what it's going to cost you to get the chemistry there either. Yeah. I'll have to see what it looks like. I'm not sure, you know, film is something I'm trying out. I'm not sure how much, it depends what the results are like and how much I get into it in the next few weeks or so. That's, that's what it's going to be. I have to see how it works out. All right. When the weather gets better here and the colors come out in the autumn, particularly. And yeah, I can sense that it could become pricey. Okay. Um, on our group drive, there's all kinds of informational stuff on film and chemistry and uh, filters for black and white film. Yeah. The contrast filters. Okay. Right. <clears throat> but you can research all that using Google. Yeah. That's so, great. Yeah. Um, right. but, the but the three filters I keep, so yellow or red and a green, you probably don't need a green, but maybe having an orange might be nice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then, you're, of course, your ND stuff. And if you're using the ND, then you have to deal with reciprocity. Yeah. <laughs> but there is a really, really good iPhone app. I have it. Okay. Yeah, reciprocity is the I, – I looked at it the other day. I haven't needed to use it yet. It, but it's, It has uh, the red icon on your screen, right? Yeah, and then you can scroll to the film you're using. And – Film and, and – yeah, offset. Yeah, that's the one. It's even got bellows on it for the large format, hasn't it? Yep. Yeah. But of course, you won't use that, but not yet. <laughs> but yeah, that's 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 the one to use for uh, adjusting your reciprocity. But like I said, just remember with uh, a, a, a cross one hundred until you get to one hundred twenty seconds, you don't have any adjustment. Yeah. And that's just crazy. Yeah, it's amazing. All right. <laughs> well, that's all I have for you today. Um, that's good. We'll, we'll do another hangout on um, the zone and uh, filters, I think. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah, it sounds good. I'll let you know how I get on this week. I'm sure some of my photos from the digital camera might make it into the critique, I'm guessing, depending on what the weather's like for me. All right. All right. And then, like I said, we'll do more on film again later. Uh, but have fun and stay safe out there in the wilds, there in the snow. Yeah, thanks. I'm hoping it's all right. I'm going on my own as well, so I'm going to have to have to make sure I'm safe. I've got all the apps that you need, but I'm not going anywhere too wild. I'm going. I'm going to a quieter part, but still not like in the wilds anywhere. It's be crazy to do that in January. <laughs> you you can find hotels. Yeah, yeah, I've got three places where I'm staying. They've got last-minute deals. Um, I'll be going past that the most famous mountain that you see in all the photos now, you know, that pointy-looking one. I've never been to that, but it'll be full of tourists there, so I'm going to try and find some quieter places. All right. Well, have fun. I'm looking forward to seeing your, your work from the trip. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that. It's really helpful. 
All right, well, like I said, we'll do more, um, but I will get there and I'll get you leveled up right now. Great. All Thanks right, let's talk to you later. Talk to you later, bye. Bye-bye.